Hi everyone. This video is a book review about a book that caught my eye while I was going on my little adventure looking for new books on thriftbooks.com. And the title of this book is called Hot Plants, Nature's Proven Sex Boosters for Men and Women by Chris Kilham, The Medicine Hunter. Now, I have a lot of books in my thrift books wish list, so I decided that if I'm going to get um, health books, I want to have a multiple array of health books on a certain subject matter. So I have books in my wish list for like arthritis, books in my wish list about women's health, and now I'm starting to get more books about libido. Why libido? Mostly because a lot of people, especially guys, come up to me asking me questions about natural ways of raising their libido. And it wasn't something I was really interested in before, but now that I've met a lot of people that have this issue, I decided to try to learn as much as I can of natural ways of increasing the libido. So this book was pretty short. It wasn't too long. It wasn't too short. It was rather informative. It was told in a very uh, story-like way. So I did learn a lot. Most of the herbs in this book I was already familiar with, or yeah, I was already familiar with. However, I was introduced to two or three new herbs that I had never heard of before and reintroduced to herbs that I thought were for something else. I got a chance to learn about the environment that the herbs were in and how the native people of that land or the indigenous people of that land use the herb for, I guess, libido of the nation. But before I get into all of that, let me tell you a little bit about the author. So the author, Chris Kilham, published this book in 2004, so it is almost 20 years old. However, the information is still relevant. I went to his website, The Medicine Hunter, or medicinehunter.com, and we are going to read his beginning quote. This is what he told NBC Nightly News. We are destroying the world's greatest pharmacy. It is very important that we protect the rainforest and everything that we do. Chris Kilham is a medicine hunter, author, educator, and yogi. The founder of Medicine Hunter Inc. Chris has conducted medicinal plant research and sustainable botanical sourcing in over 45 countries. Chris works with companies to develop and popularize traditional plant-based food and medicinal products into market successes. These include ashwagandha, kava, maca, rhodiola, shisandra, I don't know if it's tamanu oil or tamanu oil, cat's claw, dragon's blood, ayahuasca, and hundreds of other plants. Now, ayahuasca or ashwagandha I know is an adapted genic herb. It's usually used for stress relief and all of that. Kava kava or kava, I've heard it being used for stress. Maca for libido, rhodiola for energy, shisandra, I, I only know it's good for the kidneys. Tamanu or tamanu oil is an almost like a natural sunscreen and it's a green oil. Cat's claw, I don't know what it's used for. Dragon's blood, I've only seen it used externally. And ayahuasca, people go on their ayahuasca adventures, so you probably heard of that. Chris's, Chris also works to bridge worlds, regularly sharing information about other cultures through presentations and media. The New York Times calls Chris part David Attenborough, part Indiana Jones. I did get that vibe from this book, like every single chapter seemed very extreme. <laughs> I, I don't know how to explain it. It was just like somebody condensed a television show into a, how many pages is this book? Into a uh, 208 page book. Chris has appeared on over 1,500 radio programs and more than 500 TV programs worldwide with features in the New York Times, ABC News Nightline, Forbes, 
The Wall Street Journal, The Dr. Oz Show, NBC Nightly News, Good Morning America, ABC 2020, Psychology Today. Oh my God, it goes on and on and on. Chris appears on both TV on TV, both online and in U.S. and international television markets. He writes articles on plant medicines for several publications and was a special guest correspondent and weekly contributing writer for columnist Fox News Health for nine years. He is an explorer in residence for Purity Products, a collaboration that brings to market health promoting herbal concepts that Chris supports. These products are large based on his findings on botanical expeditions. So he is just a very interesting person. He is very well traveled. I did not realize that I had actually seen one of his products a couple of years ago, which was um, hot plants. based off the name of this book. I don't know if they're making hot plants anymore because if you go on Amazon, you cannot find hot plants. I did end up finding hot plants for him, which are libido herbs for men on Vitacost, but I honestly don't know how old that bottle is. It seems like it's discontinued. But if you go on Purity Products, he does have um, one product called Zestosterone <laughs> that is pretty, yeah, kind of targeted for men. Now, as I was reading this book, I noticed that in a couple of chapters, people would tell him in regards to the plants that maybe you should have a partner that you use this with. Like, don't take this unless you have somebody you're going to use it with. And it made me curious if he ever got married. So before I searched to see if he got married, I thought in my mind, what type of woman or man, because I, well, woman, because he seemed like heterosexual. But I imagine in my mind what type of woman this man would marry. Um, what type of woman he would possibly be interested in before I researched to see if he got married. So in my mind, before I checked my facts, I imagine that he would be involved with a woman who was very adventurous probably would look, you know, like very exotic or just really beautiful. Most likely she would have to be into plants and either travel with him or be okay with him traveling. Like if she was a stay-at-home person, she would have to be okay with him traveling. But most likely he would want somebody that would travel with him. And lo and behold, and I googled this, who did he end up marrying? But this beautiful lady named, hold on. Now, Chris is 70 years old. So his partner is Zoe Helene, Helene, I think. And she is 58 years old. She is a classically trained multidisciplinary artist, environmentalist, and cultural activist who founded Cosmic Sister, an environmental feminist collective, and originated psychedelic feminism. Yes, his perfect soulmate. She's like very spiritual looking. She's like, she's also into plants. She's also into nature. So he found his perfect person, which I'm very happy for him. They married in, or they, what's it, they get married? No. Hold up. They've been in a relationship since 2007. So, yay. Good luck to them. They are soulmates in my book. But anyway, hold on. I'm trying to expand this screen. <sighs> so, anyway. As I go through this book, I have some of the herbs that he recommended in the book. Most of my herbs are either in capsule form, powder form, or they are in the loose herb form. I do not have all of the herbs, but I do have a nice amount. 
and the other ones you can possibly look up on the internet to see what they look like. I don't have it in its, you know, natural state, just its dried, cut and sifted, or powdered state. So we are going to begin with the for introduction. In our journey together through the world of hot plants, I will take you to the Amazon, Africa, China, India, Malaysia, Siberia, the Middle East, and other lands. As we travel, I will introduce you to the most effective sex-enhancing plants. If you believe that nature offers no true aphrodisiacs and that only pharmaceutical drugs can enhance your sex life, the guide you hold in your hands will convince you otherwise. He said, we may never know when people first employed plants to enhance their sexual desire, function, or satisfaction. And he talks a little bit about the Neanderthals and different things. He said, we eat plants, drink their juices, wear their fibers, color with their dyes, build homes with materials derived from them, employ them as medicines, and use them to enhance our life experience in a variety of ways. We also employ a select number of very special plants to enhance sex. We always have and always will use these hot plants. What I found very interesting throughout the book is that no matter where he went, when he was asking about these particular hot plants, the indigenous people there already knew what he was talking about. They would say the same name. They'd be like, oh yeah, this, oh yeah, that. Like it was just common knowledge. Like what do you, what should you drink every day? Water, that's common knowledge. What do we breathe? Oxygen, what's in the sky? The sun. And it was the same for these indigenous people. Like they knew what the plant was for. They incorporated the plant in foods and drinks. They had like festivals for the plants. And I just thought that was very interesting because I'm in the United States. I know like we know what most people or at least the ones that are in the health industry or like are on their health journey usually gravitate towards certain plants that they've been told help with something. So like, for example, elderberry syrup. They're like, oh, you're sick. Get some elderberry syrup. Oh, you're sick. Get some black seed oil. Yeah, get some sea moss. And it'll be like those three things that they'll get over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Even though there's a host of other plants, thousands of other plants, they don't go towards those plants. They only go towards the ones that they really know, that they probably used since childhood, that their grandmother told them about, that they know works for them. So they just get it over and over and over. And that is what you see in this book. So he starts off the first hot plant that he starts off with is Tonkit Ali. Now I do not have Tonkit Ali by itself. I have only seen Tonkit Ali. I have not seen it in the loose herb form. I've only seen it in a powder, a capsule, and a tincture, and that's the only form I've seen it with. It is really one of the most popular herbs people have told me or asked me about over and over and over. It's starting to gain more traction. In the past, it was probably like maca, horny goat weed, all of that. But now Tonkin Ali is starting to gain traction. This, let's see. Let me see if I have it. Hold on. This blend from Zoo is a horny goat weed blend, but it has Tonkin Ali in it. It only has 100 milligrams of Tonkin Ali. I recommend this this um, vitamin for men and women. I would consult your doctor first before you know you take it, but it has some pretty good herbs in there. So if I don't have the actual herb right here, I'm just going to show you on this bottle. So right now it has 100 milligrams of Tonkin Ali, which means one capsule would be like 50 milligrams, so you have to take two capsules a day to get 100 milligrams. So Tonkin Ali is from Malaysia. Um, it says three Orang Asli, Malaysia's Aboriginal people, chopped a mature Tonkin Ali root, 
one of the most powerful aphrodisiac plants on earth, out of the dense soil on a dangerous slope. I kept a watchful eye for deadly snakes, red-headed crates, and king cobras in particular. Tonkin Ali is a popular name for, no, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. I do apologize for butchering the botanical name. It looks like it says Euricoma longifolia, capital E-U-R-Y-C-O-M-A, and the next word is L-O-N-G-I-F-O-L-I-A. A medium-sized, slender tree reaching 10 meters in height. The name Tonkit Ali means Ali's walking stick, so you can guess what that means. Another folk name for the plant is Longjack. These names. By any moniker, Tonkit Ali is native to Malaysia, Lower Burma, Thailand, and Indonesia. The plant thrives in shade and flourishes under the canopy of the rainforest. The root is employed as a traditional remedy for the treatment of malaria, high blood pressure, fevers, fatigue, loss of sexual desire, and impotence. It enjoys a long history of traditional use and a growing body of serious science corroborating its effectiveness. I think that's pretty interesting how when an herb is used for libido, that's all it's really known for, but it'll have a host of properties that can help your body. For example, maca, maca. Maca um, not only helps with libido, it helps with bone health, particularly red maca, which is targeted for women. It helps with um, your hair. It helps with, some people have used it to lose weight. Some people have used it to gain weight. It's a nourishing food, so people have made it into flour. It just does a lot of things. <clears throat> That's why I was surprised to see ashwagandha in here because I've only known ashwa the use of ashwagandha for concentration. I didn't realize it was used for libido. I also noticed with a lot of different herbs that they increase your circulation, which I guess in a sense will increase your libido, or they might affect your kidneys, which... I don't know which branch of medicine it is, maybe TCM or traditional Chinese medicine, but those have an effect on the reproductive system on the sexual organs. But if you're going to use any of these plants, I would say consult your doctor, especially if you have a medical condition related to the heart, because sometimes, um, these herbs will increase the heart rate. And if you're on heart medication, that's not going to be good for you. So be sure with everyone you check with your doctor. It says, nobody knows how long Tonkin Ali has been employed for medicinal purposes, but its documented use dates back to the 1700s. And another thing that I really like about this book is that as he travels, in every single country, he either meets a medicine person or a person that is starting a company that is centered around that particular libido herb. So in this country, he says, my journey to the Malaysian Peninsula, Peninsula was inspired by Annie Ang, who first briefed me about the plant at a natural products convention a few years ago. She grew up in Penang, state in Malaysia, eventually moved to Chicago to study business and finance. She worked as a successful stockbroker for years, but Tonkin Ali stuck in her mind. She made connections with scientists and processors in Malaysia, started a company called Herbal Powers, and began to sell a concentrated extract of Tonkin Ali called LJ100 in the U.S. market. She persistently chased down anybody who she sensed might advance her cause. So some of these companies that he mentions in the book, I have not checked to see if some of them still exist. Some of them during the time of this book actually shut down before it was published. So I do not know if all of these companies are still functioning or if they were bought out by other people because, you know, that happens. So they'll conform a, a not conform. 
I, I can't remember, not a consortium, but whatever, you know, they'll blend into other companies. So he goes to Malaysia and they get in a pickup truck. They're going from the city to the country. The original inhabitants of the peninsular Malaysia, today about 80,000 Orang Asli, remain scattered throughout the country. Though many have moved to cities and towns, have married non-aboriginals and have been assimilated into modern culture, a number of Orang Asli choose to live in settlements and villages in the forest, leading simpler lives, absent of most modern amenities. So, Okay. Another thing that I notice about this book is he'll have the medicine person talk about the herb and then he'll have a scientist talk about the herb. So one person that he mentioned was Dr. Johari Saad, who is known as the King of Tonkin Ali, a brilliant scientist, inventor, engineer, and former professor at the University of Malaysia. Dr. Joe Hari, or Joe as he is called, has conducted the definitive animal research on Tonkit Ali. So this is what he found out about it. Increasing, okay. When given Tonkit Ali extract, animals copulate three to four times more frequently than normal. Well, interesting. This is due, as it turns out, to a significant increase in testosterone. In fact, testosterone levels in animals given Tonkin Ali increase an unprecedented three to four times on average. This is an astounding increase in the sex hormone most closely associated with libido. In laboratory tests on human testicular tissue, Tonkin Ali extract increased the formation of testosterone fourfold. It says, um, okay, but he said from age 30 or so, blood levels of the hormone of testosterone decline at a rate. So he's just talking about the, the decline. Um, Chris Killam is an ethno, ethnobotanist, so, you know, he says, those who work in the field of ethnobotany understand that there's simply no incentive, incentive whatsoever for a large population of people to use a plant for a particular purpose over many generations if that plant does not deliver. So he goes briefly about women and why there weren't that many studies on women. And he states, men tend to run countries, governments, and economies. They care a great deal more about male sexual issues and needs than those of women. So for women, it also works as a testosterone builder. And this in women is proactive for sex drive. It not only triggers a woman's libido, it is also essential to pleasure. So, interesting. So he just... He goes to Kuala Lumpur, Lumpur, if I'm not mistaken, to meet Kak Yang, if I'm pronouncing her name right. And she's a woman herbalist, or she's an herbalist. And she was a traditional woman herbalist, or Bomo. On arriving, we were greeted by her family of six. They had been busy setting up all the necessary elements for making a traditional herbal formula, or Jamu. Now, I've heard of Jamu, Probably, I want to say it was it was literally before 2017, I know. I, mean, I would even say 2012, but I'm not sure. There is a book about Jammu, and it talks about like the drinks that they make for health. And that's one book on my wish list that I've had on my wish list for over five years. And I literally need to get it because what am I waiting for? But she said, <clears throat> my great-great-grandmother was an herbalist, and then my great-great-grandmother, my grandmother, and my mother. I'm the fifth generation of women in my family who practice traditional herbal medicine. 
He watched her prepare the jamu with Tonkin Ali as the primary ingredient. And this is what she said, because he brought a film crew to film this, and I really want to see this documentary. She roasted the large pile of dried herbs in a black iron wok over an open fire. She stated, this will make the herbs easier to pound into powder. It dries them more and they will be brittle, so they will break apart with less work. After the roasting process was completed, she emptied the herbs into a deep wooden pounding vessel, hefting a heavy rod of iron. She beat the herb chunks into the vessel with the rod end, breaking them up into increasingly small pieces as she labored in the hot sun. After about 20 minutes of pounding, she had reduced much of the herbal pile to dust. She dumped the pounded herbs onto a fine sifter and shook it over a spread of piece of newspaper. The fine powder that made it through the mess was the jamu, the formula. Now you can use jamu in this form or you can make it into a man majun by adding honey and rolling it into balls or you can cook it in an oil and make a massage preparation. I make formulas for men and women with Tonkin Ali, and it is very good to increase sexual vitality in either case. And what's funny is at the end, she gave him a small dark bottle of oil, and she's like, this is for your penis. If you like it, call me and tell me your experience. So everywhere he went, he would get the herb in different forms. Sometimes it will be in an oil. Sometimes it will be in a drink. Sometimes it will be in a food. And at the end, he did use, he did use the plant. He did use the oil. I, I want to say, I, I don't know where he, yeah. I guess he said it did work, but I don't know where he said it. But yeah, moving on. Next thing he did was he went to Russia to find rhodiola, rhodiola rosea. And I don't have the herb, the loose herb, but I do have it in the capsules, rhodiola rosea. I've known of rhodiola to give energy and stamina, but I did not know it was used for libido. I, I didn't know that. And it was in Russia. Um, they were going to Siberia. And the reason it was called Rhodiola rosea was apparently the roots smelled like roses. And since it increases your energy, it decreases your stress. And he says, stress can make a mess of your love life in insidious ways. In fact, stress causes innumerable flaccid erections, dry vaginas, and cases of lost sexual desire in men and women. That is true. That is very true. Because sometimes when you're stressed, when you're just having freaking money issues, when you're having health issues, that is literally the last thing on your mind. You're using your sexual energy for complete survival and as a coping mechanism. And the only time you'll see a lot of people overly sex as if they are stressed because sometimes they will use st sex as a release for their stress which i guess is okay but after a while it can get toxic like solving your problems in a way that makes sense or in a healthy manner that isn't like too overly sexed or too much of anything would be a good idea so anyway he said, in traditional folk medicine, rhodiola rosea has been employed to promote energy and stamina, to banish fatigue, to restore the nervous system after exhaustion, to boost sexual desire, and to treat impotence. In antiquity, preparations of the root were used to treat colds, flu, depression, cancer, and gastrointestinal complaints. Methods of preparation and locations of plants were often jealously guarded by families of healers, and Rhodiola rosea became such a legendary invigorating agent and booster of sexual potency that Chinese emperors sent expeditions to Siberia expressly to gather the root. Now the herb that I have is from Nature's Answer, 
and this is 100 milligrams of rhodiola rosea root extract. He said, in the 1990s, a few supplement makers put out rhodiola rosea products in the United States, but they were poorly marketed and never made much of a splash. Nonetheless, I dug into existing research on the herb. So he went to Siberia, went to the taiga, T-A-I-G-A, -A, and he found Siberia's great healer, Uri, I don't know if it's Yuri or Uri, Vladimirovich, Vladimirovich, Siberia's most beloved herbal healer. He said, my grandmother lived deep in the taiga, the forest. She knew all the plants in our area and she understood how to use them for healing. So when I was a young boy, I learned from her. She would take me into the woods and gather plants. So they asked him about rhodiola. And he said, that herb is one of the very most important. It gives you strength. It will help you regain energy. It also helps to fight stress. In this way, it builds up very good health. If you are sick, it will help you recover. It is surely the greatest agent for sexual vigor. I have seen many people who suffer sexual trouble because of sickness or some other causes. They take rhodiola rosea, and within a short while, they regain their desire and their ability to have sex. I think that is the very best thing for sex. So they, they go out to the mountains, like some of these herbs he tried to find in the marketplace, but then he would have to find either a local to take him to where the herb was abundant, which I found very, very interesting. And the overall, as I stated earlier, <clears throat> the overall tone of this book almost sounds like an adventure touristy book. I mean, it was very educational, but it also had this touristy type of adventure vibe. Like I was watching a television show. Some parts made me like uncomfortable, um, not because of the sexual herbs. It was mostly, I felt like he was, and I don't know if he was doing this on purpose, but it felt like he was doing a caricature of the cultures of people, especially like Africans. Like, why did he name that chapter the Heart of Darkness? But okay, whatever. But yeah, ah. he did end up finding the rhodiola rosea. He did end up smelling the roots, ironically. Another part that stood out in this chapter was... Um, only a few, it was where they saw some horses. He said, only a few kilometers along the trail, we encountered a group of wild horses. The horses had sleek coats and powerful, well-defined muscles. They stood eating a patch of plants I thought I recognized. That's Rap, Raponticum, noted Yevgeny with a laugh, second only to Rhodiola rosea in popularity. Raponticum, Carthamo, well, I don't even know, is used by locals for stamina and by athletes for its ability to increase lean muscle mass. They like this herb very much at the horses. In the harvest season, we try to get the plants before the horses do, but they beat us to many of the plants. But I will take you over a couple of valleys where the, most of the plants can be found. Another thing that I found interesting was as he was searching for the main herb of the chapter, he would come across other herbs that sounded very interesting, but he never went into detail with them, probably because he was focused on that main plant. But there were a couple of herbs. I'm like, huh, I need to look, I need to look this up. This herb sounds pretty interesting. So the next one, this chapter was called From Russia with Love. But why did he call Africa the heart of darkness? Like, you could have called it anything, but you called it the heart of darkness. Dude, buddy. That sounds very colonizer-ish, but that's just my personal opinion. Let's see how this chapter starts off and tell me if, I, if I'm overreacting. He said, On a hot, sticky May night in Accra, Ghana, 
and the herb we're talking about is yohembe. I sat under a starry sky, enraptured by a group of African mus musicians and dancers. The dozen performers gave a show that was at once dynamic, polyrhythmic, and infectiously exciting in its hip-shaking, butt-wiggling, breast-jiggling celebration of life. I mean, I know this book is about sex and everything. I know it's about sex. However, like, it was like he just went extreme. Kind of like the the um, mindset other people have is like, black people, they're so overly sexualized. They're just so sexual. That's how I felt. That was the energy I felt he began this chapter with, for real. It's like, they all they do is just, just fuck each other and have dance parties. And that's really what I heard in my mind. <laughs> that's what I translated as I began this chapter. But... Four drummers beat out ingenious rhythms that mingled and flowed fast and slow, alternating between the slow heartbeat of the jungle and the rapid, pulsating beat of carnival. The three striking women dancers in the group stood short, medium, and tall, each one taking turns as the featured performer accentuating the moves of her performance with her bodily shape. The tallest of the three possessed a Grace Jones angularity and moved in a sultry, leopard-like manner, relying on the smooth flow of her long legs and arms to convey an essential sexuality. Like he just... The more full-fledged, medium-height dancer thrust and bounced the mounds of her bottom in a manner utterly astonishing for her pneumatic speed and precision control. The shortest of the dancers moved with an erotic, suggestive undulation similar to the second. My attention was immediately drawn to her feet. Barefoot like the other performers, she slapped her feet on the ground with well-articulated precision, yet soundlessly as though right at the point of impact, an insulating air cushion silenced the percussion of her soles on the patio tile on which she moved. Well, I would just got hot reading that, okay. But you know, what was interesting in this chapter was he did end up with two women that night. So maybe he got what he wanted. But this was in Ghana. And he went there to find Yohembe. And I do not have, let's see if I can do this. Let's see if I want to, let's see. Hold on, I don't, I don't want to bust my bag open. This is Yohembe. It is not from Ghana. It is from Cameroon. Yohembe. Yohembe. Pawson Stelia. Yohembe or Yohembe. It says not to be used during pregnancy, not to be used while nursing, not for use in persons with liver or kidney disease or in chronic inflammation of the sexual organs or prostate gland, not for excessive or long-term use. So this is from Star Wars Botanicals. This is what it looks like this. Wish I had it. Let me go get a spoon. One second. Because I know... Conveniently, I have a spoon <laughs> in my room. How? How convenient. So you can see what it looks like. This is the Yohimbe. You see it? It's brown. I have seen Yohimbe in bark form, cut and sifted. I have seen it in pill form, powdered form and also liquid extract. And this herb is very, very popular. I can attest to that. It is extremely popular. And it's not in this blend, but I have seen it in other blends. There was a blend called Cobra, which I think is either being reformulated or discontinued, but I showed you Cobra before in another video. And it has Yohimbe in it. It also has a um, oat straw, stinging nettle, and something else in there. But anyway, back to this book. Yohimbine. I, I don't know if it's Yohimbin or Bine, 
or Yohimbine. I'm just going to call it Yohimbine because that's what it looks like to me. Y-O-H-I-M-B-I-N-E. Maybe it's Yohimbine. The primary alkaloid found in Yohimbe bark is a known fast-acting central nervous system stimulant with specific action upon the nerves of the lower spine. That kind of sounds like kundalini almost. Like it moves up the spine. It causes dilation of the peripheral muscles of the corpus cavernosum, the erectile tissue that forms the dorsal and sides of the penis. In plain words, the bark extract promotes a good, firm erection. So, if you're looking for an herb, dudes, I think this would be a good one. But, as I stated earlier, if you have a heart condition or something on medication, go to your doctors and ask if it's okay. This penis vessel dilating activity has given Yohim Bine, or Bine, has given it a well-deserved reputation as a sexual stimulant. An erection is the result of engorgement of the fine vessels of the corpus cavernosum, and Yohimbe makes that engorgement occur. Voila, an erection is born. Now that is in men. In women, it promotes increased circulation to the clitoris, promoting what some refer to as a clitoral buzz. <laughs> <laughs> I've never, I've never heard of that. A clitoral buzz. Wow. Okay. The stimulation produced by Yohimbe in this manner makes the plant a very significant sexual stimulant for women as well as men. Though typically men use Yohimbe far more than women. I, that is true. I have noticed that. I've noticed more women use Damiana than men. The only time I've seen a man use Damiana was when he was mixing it in. I think he was mixing it in with his, his weed. I think he sold weed and he would be like mixing it in with the weed. Um, which I guess would, it looked, I guess it looked similar to weed. I don't know. Like he could probably blend it in very well, but some herbs, some libido herbs, men and women will just think it's only for that sex when it in actuality most herbs are for both sexes so i have seen more men gravitate towards yohimbe than women because in the woman's mind she's like oh no that'll that's that's for men like it's probably high in testosterone that won't help me well maybe some of these men herbs will actually really boost you the only herb i've ever seen both parties like get on a regular basis would be maca maca um yellow maca is common for um it's just the most common maca red maca both parties can take it but they usually recommend it for women and then black maca, both parties can take it, but they usually recommend it for men. But maca is another chapter. I, I'm on Yohimbe now. Whew. So he says he's going to the market. And as they go to the market, he's with somebody named Joseph. I explained to Joseph that I wish to see any medicinal plants being sold in any form. He said, you want to see the medicinal medis traditional medicines? I know exactly where to take you. So Joseph spoke to a number of vendors and explained to me what I was looking for and what various herbs were for. He picked up a small handful of bark and asked, you know Yohimbe? I told him I was especially interested in Yohimbe. He related that to the vendor who displayed the bark, and that led to some good-natured banter about the sexual power of Yohembe. So every market he goes to, when the vendors find out what he's looking for, they just like, oh, I have this, I have this, I have this. Like every single market in almost every single country, it never fails. Like the power of sales is universal, okay? What another thing I notice in this book is that 
no matter where he went, if the plant became popular, it would almost automatically be over harvested. So no matter which country he went to, they were all starting to develop the same problem, over harvesting of that particular plant. And each country was trying to come up with a solution to preserve their plant. So some of the solutions were to get acres and acres of land specifically for that plant or to, um, I guess, do create the plant in different forms where they can stretch it out a little bit. Um, some of these plants that came to the United States or other parts of the world outside of that country wasn't as potent because it wasn't growing as long. Like, for example, Fodi root or Hushawu. I had an herbalist tell me that most of the Hushawu that we have in the United States wasn't that potent because most of the most potent roots of Fodi root would be seven years older, seven years and up. If you really wanted a really potent root, it'd be maybe at least 100 years old. But a lot of people don't have that. They don't have the patience to wait for the herb to mature, to be harvested sustainably, all of that. So that is a problem. If you read this book, you will notice in almost every single country. And this was back in 2004. So imagine what it's like now. Either the herb has been over harvested or it, they set something in place to make the herb stretch out longer. It always, it always makes me like kind of weary when I hear of a popular herb, like it's like, oh, this is popular. I don't think of like the properties of the herb. I automatically think of the people and like what is happening to their country. <laughs> like, I don't want to say like, oh my God, those poor people. But like, that's, that's really literally where my mind goes to because they're probably over harvesting because they want the money. <clears throat> so it says, Hmm. Okay. At the next table, another man announced to us that he also had Yohimbe for sale. We moved along and spoke with him a while. I have seen many men use this bark with very good results, said the man in good English. I asked how the bark was usually prepared, and the vendor, whose name was Edgar, said that boiling the bark for an hour or so and consuming the resulting tea. They was the best way to derive its benefits. Edgar made the universal sign of a sturdy erection with his arm and made a comment about Yohimbe helping a man to have sex with many women. Then Joseph, <laughs> I don't know, this was my favorite laughing part. Then Joseph announced proudly that he didn't need any Yohimbe or anything else for that matter to have sex with many women. I don't need any Yohembe. I am as strong as a horse. That's what I imagine he said in his mind. Um, I, I inquired whether there was any more popular sex plant in that region. No, Edgar and Joseph told me, Yohembe was king. But there wasn't as much as there used to be, Edgar said with great sadness. A lot of the trees are gone and much of the forest is gone too. And that is what you will notice in almost every single chapter. As soon as it gets popular, they just go on a grab. It's like, choo, 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 before it's all gone. Huh. So I'm not trying to make this too long. One chapter is horny goat weed, which I didn't know it came from China. I had heard of horny goat weed. I've had a, seen a lot of people get horny goat weed, but I didn't do much research on it. And I don't know who popularized this. I want to say it was an American. But let's see. I'm going to show you some of the plants that I have. So as far as maca, I have black maca. And I have a red maca. These are the... the actually, I'm going to show you what I've, I've taken on a regular basis, like when I was on my routine. I was taking this, I was drinking this every day, and I was taking this every day. And 
when I say, <laughs> when I took the red maca, one thing I noticed, I was also taking a weight gain vitamin, or weight gain powder, and I think with the, the maca, it was increasing my weight. It was increasing my appetite. I wouldn't get an automatic surge of energy with the maca, but all of a sudden in the day, in the middle of the day, I would just get a surge of energy. I was also like feeling more heat in my body. Maybe it was increasing my circulation. I don't know, but I was getting hungrier. I was eating more. Um, it helped with my cycle. Like it was helping regulate my cycle because I feel I may have PCOS. I haven't been officially diagnosed with it, but I have a lot of the symptoms of it. But for two or three months, I was taking maca, damiana, chlorella, and blue spirulina every single day in a water bottle. And my cycle in the past used to be gone nine months. It would be gone six months. I finally started tracking it. When it came, it was almost as if it hadn't come at all. That was the most painless thing I've ever had. So if you are a woman that has that have fertility issues, that has an irregular cycle, I think maca will help you too. A lot of men will take the maca before their workouts because they feel like it gives them a lot of energy. There, I've seen a lot of different macas. I've only seen one brand that has all three macas, and that is um, it's from Sunfood. Sunfood has red maca, they have black maca, and they have one called Maca Extreme. And Maca Extreme has red, black, and yellow. The black is the least common. This is the red. But you know what's interesting? Most of the, the powders look the same. Like it's like, oh, it's it kind of has a red tint to it. And I really don't mind the taste. I actually like the taste of maca. Some people don't like it, but I do. Like, it makes me feel better. And this is the maca. Wish I could just eat it right now, but I'm not going to do all that. Another is ashwagandha. I did not know this was used for libido, honestly. I, I just thought it was used for concentration and stress. But, you know, if it's used for libido, that makes sense, too. I wish I had all of the other herbs, but I don't right now. So let us move on to maca, which is from Peru. And I'm going to just kind of flip through some of these chapters, sorry. So he said, maca is one of my favorite hot plants. Maca does not originate from a tradition of erotica and is not mentioned in any exotic lover or love text. It is a vegetable that grows in somewhat nasty place. This humble turnip-shaped member of the mustard family originates from the inhospitable central highlands of Peru, a wind-blown, oxygen-deprived, high-altitude land with poor soil and hail on the best days of summer. What I really enjoyed about this book was it gave me more insight onto, into the environment that the herb originated from. Because I would know of the herbs, but I never considered their environment. I, I couldn't imagine their environment from the top of my head. It has over 2,000 years of safe, it is non-toxic, and it is a staple food. It even tastes good. You can make blender drinks, cookies, and pancakes with maca. Boy, I want some maca pancakes. On the back of the sun foods, they have a maca gazpacho. This looks delicious, don't it? It's a little recipe, but anyway. So he said, according to the Peruvian legend during the height of their empire, Incan warriors would consume maca before entering battle. The maca imbued them with fierce strength and made the Inca daunting adversaries against other fighters. After conquering any city, the Incan soldiers were prohibited from eating maca to protect the conquered women from their powerful sexual impulses. Now, I can, I can see that. Like, when I was taking the maca and I was taking the Damiana, I'm not like a very sexual person. Like, you know, some people are like, oh, I'm sexual, I'm doing this. And they'll like wear sexual clothes. I'm not really like that. I'm just like kind of boring. 
And <laughs> when I was taking the maca and the Damiana, I guess my way of just like libido was just like I would feel like I could just run seven miles. I'm like, I'm gonna run seven miles right now. Yeah, I'm gonna go. Yeah, let's go. I, I guess that was my form of libido. <laughs> like I was like, I'm gonna do everything. I just felt very aggressive. Not like in a bad way, but that's really how I felt like. I felt like, like, man, I'm just gonna climb this mountain. Nothing's gonna stop me. I can do anything I put my mind to, man. Let's just, let's just fight. But not fight, but like fight my for my goals. That's how I felt when I was taking the maca. Like, and I feel like these hot plants do something to your pheromones. Because sometimes when I be taking these reproductive organ plants, it was like sending a message out to the universe, like, hey, she's taking these libido herbs. Everybody come to her now. And they'd be just be coming to me. And I'd be like, why are you coming to me? Like, go away. Like, stand back. Like, even people that already knew me, who were my friends, I'm like, are you okay? Like, why are you? All right. But anyway. So, Maka. The South American country of Peru is home to extraordinarily diverse terrain, including stark desert coastline, vast Amazon forests, majestic snow-capped Andean peaks, and Titicaca, the world's highest, if that's how you pronounce it, nav nav navigable lake. Cruciferous plants, which I guess Maka is a cruciferous, Maka grows in a limited geographic area at elevations between 3,500 and 4,575 meters, 10,000 and 15,000 feet. The primary area of maca cultivation is the Junin Plateau, where approximately 400 hectares, is that how you pronounce it, hectares? 1,000 acres of maca were grown in the year 2000, mostly in small family plots. It says, many Peruvians consider maca a panacea, claiming that maca stimulates metabolism, regulates hormonal secretion, and combats anemia. I can believe that. They also say that maca helps improve memory and fight depression. Maybe that's why I felt like I could run 10 miles. Hmm. Maca is promoted as an aphrodisiac stamina builder and fertility enhancer. That I believe. Oh, another thing I noticed with maca is like, it felt like my breast size was changing. Like if I didn't notice bigger breasts, but I felt like they were getting heavier. So maybe they were growing. I've heard of women adding on like breast size and like all of that. I also noticed that I felt like I was getting curvier. Maybe more fat deposits were getting onto me. I, I really don't know. But at the same time, I was also taking weight gain powder. But after I stopped the weight gain powder, I was still kind of getting those results. Maybe when you're taking these libido herbs, it tones anything that's related to the sexual organs. So like if you're, you're, your body is preparing for the mating, so you might like get more fat deposits, you might increase in your breast size, you might increase in your muscle definition. Just a thought. Enthusiasts of the plant tout maca as a laxative, which may be attributable to its fiber content and as a cure for rheumatism and respiratory disorders. So yeah, that's one. Another plant, because I want this video to be exactly an hour, is a ZA. L L O U H. I don't know if it's Zayu or Zalu. And it's basically from, I want to say the Middle East. Where is it from? According to legend, Shir Sal is in the Middle East. But which part of the Middle East? Lebanon. So Zayu was an herb I had never heard of before. Zalu, Zayu. And the person that started the company for it, their company shut down. Another herb that I had heard of but I didn't know much about was Katuaba. And that was, uh, that's a plant that is from um, 
Brazil. So if you are interested in learning deeper information about these hot plants, I do recommend this book. It was a short read. It was kind of funny. I was like, you know what? I kind of like this. It was literally like watching a television show. So yeah, good job. Thank you for sharing all this information in a short condensed form. I did learn a lot and I'm glad I'm going to keep it on my shelf. And I also recommend it for anybody who is interested in naturally enhancing their sex life. So talk to you later, everyone. Happy reading and happy hot plants. Bye-bye.